Well, this is a global move. Now, remember, China is clearly in, in, the, in issues. Europe is clearly having issues. This, to me, is potentially the reset of a lifetime. I think it's very disconcerting once we start heading back that way. Mike McGlone is back. He's a senior commodity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Let's revisit his call from last time we had him on the show a couple months ago and what's next for the markets. Uh, Mike, welcome back. Thank you, David. It's good to be back. I always enjoy talking to you. I always enjoy talking to you as well. The audience, uh, uh, well, you're a fan favorite. The audience really appreciates your analysis. Last time you were talking about how Bitcoin could lead the charge downward. Well, since then, we had a number of days of uh, tremendous volatility, as you know, a couple of weeks or a week and a half ago. Actually, exactly two weeks ago on today, on Monday, we had this um, spike up in the VIX to 60. Now, um, that day aside, because a lot of the losses from that particular weekend, long weekend, uh, were uh, – were, um, you know, we we did see a rebound, but I did I did want to bring to the audience's attention your recent report entitled "Is Bitcoin Leading the Way Back Down?" Now, this one you wrote uh, about a week ago, and I'll just read a paragraph here. Born of the financial crisis and quantitative easing, Bitcoin has led most risk assets to this year's highs and may be doing the same on the way back down. It says here, Bitcoin may be sniffing out bottoming stock market volatility. At about 24 times on August 12th, the ounces of gold equal to one crypto was first traded in uh, Q1 of 2021 when the S&P 500 e-mini futures was around 3,900 versus closer to 5,400 now. The asset, some have called the fastest horse in the race, may play catch up. But with equity volatility recovered from multi-year lows, poor performing Bitcoin appears to be leading a reversion. Okay, uh, I'll let you comment on that, and then we can look at some charts. What do you mean by all this? Yeah, <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, thank you for featuring that. Um, well, the, the number is closer to 23 now. That's the amount of ounces of gold per one Bitcoin. I mean, I've been watching this ratio for at least a decade. I remember when first it went above one. I think that was around 2011. That's when I first started believing in Bitcoin. But the fact is this um, fastest horse in the race, as some people have called it, um, is potentially suggesting the race is over. So the Bitcoin to gold ratio peaked around 37, I think it was. Um, that was right at the peak of the uh, biggest money pump in history, right around the beginning of 2022. And it's, it peaked again around 32, and now it's trickling lower. So it's a divergent weakness. Um, and the Bitcoiners will tell you, yeah, there's a lot of good reasons it's going to catch up. But I like to point out that the recent pump we had for Bitcoin into March was probably one of the best reasons ever for an enduring high. It was on the back of record-setting beta, the long-awaited ETF launch. So we've had, oh, what, 50 billion of inflows and the having so sometimes what you have to do is you and people say sometimes you're i'm cherry picking time no i'm trying to i'm focusing on significant events and price performance so right now as you can say since that high bitcoin's been underperforming whether other than beta going up and gold has been very consistently outperformed so i like to point out for those who have been pointing out how strong the equity market is i think on a one two and three year basis the rock is beating the stocks, S&P 500, total return, S&P 500 is below gold for one, two, and three-year basis as of August 19th. Um, and I, I think that's an indi indication something is significantly going on here that's probably tilted towards a little bit of reversion of risk assets, which we're way overdue for. And this asset, you know, Bitcoin, which was born in the great financial crisis and is taken over the world and has become, you know, it really pumps above its weight in terms of um, hype, it's starting to roll over. And I want to see signs of strength. Otherwise, I think it's, to me, a good leading indicator of what I'm expecting, what I'm seeing in commodities. I'll end with this. Gold's up 30% from the peak in 2022 when commodities peaked and crude oils and, and, and commodities, broad commodities are down 30%. So on a global basis, gold up, commodities down, that's a pretty significant global deflationary, recessionary trajectory, at least for now. And then you look over to China, and there's good reasons for that. Before we continue with the video, let me tell you about how to protect your online privacy. Do you know how much of your personal information is on the internet? Well, data brokers collect and sell your personal data, exposing you to risks like identity theft and potentially harassment. But there is a solution. Delete Me, the sponsor of this video. Delete Me removes your personal information from hundreds of data broker websites. 
I use Delete Me myself, and it's simple. Just submit your information, and their privacy experts handle the rest. In seven days, you'll receive a privacy report showing where your data was found and removed. Delete Me continuously monitors and removes your information all year long. Now, get 20% off on consumer plans with Delete Me. Go to joindeleteme.com slash David Lin and use the promo code David Lin at checkout. You can also scan the QR code on the screen here directly from your phone. Join the thousands who trust Delete Me to keep your data private. Get Delete Me today and start taking control of your online privacy. Let me uh, draw your attention to two charts here, and I will come back to your deflationary yeah. outlook because um, you, you wrote another interesting piece on that recently. I'll share my screen here for you and the audience. This is Bitcoin versus the NASDAQ. So the NASDAQ is the purple line, and Bitcoin price chart is the uh, bar chart here. Over the course of the year, we've seen several instances of divergence, most notably around June to July. And then now it seems like Bitcoin has been uh, uh, recovering um, at a slower pace than the NASDAQ has been bouncing from its um, uh, uh, first week of August lows. However, if we switch over to Bitcoin versus the Russell, we see a much more um, uh, significant correlation and a close closer overlay. So is this just a matter of the um, NASDAQ index having a few stocks pulling it away from the rest of the um index or you know is there something else going on with tech stocks and bitcoin not being as correlated as much anymore like i said bitcoin seems to be better correlated now with small caps and mid caps what's going on here so what you're showing is it can get a little confusing to using the other indices but the bottom line is i like to use bitcoin versus s p 500 for the broad and that peak that ratio of bitcoin divided by the s&p 500 just the index peaked at 15 in 2021 remember that's the peak of um of the biggest money pump in history and then had another high in 2021 the low this year was 14 the keys it's making lower highs versus beta and that's the key thing i'm worried about is pattern recognition shows that bitcoin is underperforming beta in the stock market typically it's supposed to outperform particularly with a much higher volatility annual vo annual volatility of bitcoin is about two times the nasdaq and about three times the s p 500 so if you're holding that asset and you're expecting upside you better get at least three times the um, beta when it goes up. Otherwise, you're taking a Norton amount of risk. And that's what's happening lately. So the key thing I like to point out is, so we launched these ETFs in January of this year. Since that time, the average price of Bitcoin is 60000 or so. That's been resistance. So everybody who's bought Bitcoin, on average, who's bought Bitcoin, about $50 billion worth in ETFs, is a bit underwater now. Not everyone, but the majority. And it's below its 200-day mover and average. It's below its 100-day 50 days it's all tilting back downward you need something to shift it higher and that's why i like to say that's despite record setting stock market um and gold making new highs to me this risk asset showing um maturation um and divergent weakness but it also fits into my broad macro um sense david if you look at volatility the vix volatility index 200-day moving average, 100-day moving average. It's just starting the bottom from the lowest level since 2018. So volatility is just starting to come up. And you look at things like that. Bitcoin's just starting to roll over potentially for good reason. Um, and that is we, the yield curve is just starting to disinvert. The Fed's going to start easing. Why? Going to start easing because they see that tilt towards inflation because the one key thing is unemployment is on a pretty significant sharp uptick and that's a key thing about u.s unemployment it bottom at 3.3 it's at 4.3 now bloomberg economics expects five percent a year from now it typically goes up to six percent without anything that can really stop it and that's that long um i i guess forgotten recession they got way too hyped a year ago and then they've got forgotten this year that pendulum's just swinging back so to me that's where the macro is that the u.s is tilting that towards that recession the stock market has no clue about that and certainly doesn't expect that it's telling you otherwise but the bond market is i look at i'll end with this i look at that 30 year, 30 year bond yield at 4.11 um it's well it's more than almost 200 basis points above the same bond yield in china and it's well at least 100 basis points less than fed funds so fed funds have to drop as Chairman Powell says, they're quite restrictive. And I think this elusive recession that we forgot about is just starting to kick in. And I look at things like retail sales. The, the, known, the, the known known is people say retail sales are strong, but I've been doing it for over a year. If you take 
U.S. retail sales annualized me measure, subtract out the annualized measure of CPI, it's about the same. It's negative, number one. It's, it's about the same as right before the great financial crisis. It's very poor readings. And then there's things like declining demand for diesel and unleaded gas and container boards. So from a commodity standpoint, I see clear tilt towards recession. And it looks like this fastest horse in the race is kind of leading it. And then, of course, I tilt to the one main asset I feel still remain quite bullish on is gold. And I don't see what stops that one. Wait, before we get on to uh, the market. So 5% mm -hmm. unemployment is Bloomberg Economics forecast. We're currently at 4.3%. Uh, yeah. So an almost 1% take up over the next couple a couple of months to a year. So let's let's take out seasonal factors. Let's take out I don't know if you think hurricane uh barrel for example was a, was one of the factors for why unemployment rate ticked up. That may have contributed according to some economists. But what are your reasons for why 4 5% unemployment may be possible by next year? So this is Bloomberg Economics. My my colleague Anna Wong. Yeah. I I trust their views. Sure. Um, and keep things she's been pointing out for a while is deterioration in the labor market. Um, we are going to get these re estimates, downward estimate revisions of non-farm payrolls. The key thing she says that's somewhat mostly noise. You focus on unemployment um, rate, and her um, their outlook is for Q3 by uh, at some point Q Q3 next year we should see five percent unemployment. Now her appointment. It, this year, she suspects that potentially by the time we get to that September FOMC meeting, we're going to see 4.4%. 4 .4 now it's 4.3%. So, yes, things like hurricanes are always going to disrupt these things. These aren't new, but it's the macroeconomic trend that's quite significant. Now, their models kicked into recession last year, and just like the Fed models, they were all early. But we all are, are, due, are we in the, also in the midst of the greatest amount of fiscal spending in this country since uh, any type of since a war recession so that's helping keep things buoyed i think also a key bottom line is the wealth effect uh, the key thing i like to tilt over to is when you have the stock market cap to gdp at two times gdp that's the highest since the 20s on the way up to 29 in the 30s on the way down um it's kind of silly not to expect that all that matters in terms of stock market going up sentiment Inflation going up, stock market going down, sentiment, inflation going down. And that's where we are now. So I tilt their views over to mine. Um, but I also, you know, I point this out from a commodity guy. You, I see nothing but global recessionary trends. The unemployment rate taking up to 5%. What monetary policy assumptions are behind that forecast? Are we assuming in this particular forecast that the Federal Reserve uh, will not would not change rates. Basically, what I'm getting at is, uh, you know, are Good we going to get a better, better than forecasted uh, picture in the in the in the, uh, in the labor market once the Fed starts cutting rates? So um, it's also a, a factored in. You just look at Fed fund futures right now. They're priced for a 25 basis point cut in September at the September 18th meeting, and then to keep going to keep hiking. I'm sorry to keep cutting. Um, so those are factored in. The, the difference is, and again, those are our Bloomberg Economics team estimates. I just point out it's never bottomed from such a low level on a 100 percent basis since 1947 without popping straight to 6 percent. OK, so that's what I factor in my my models. But monetary policy is always there. Always there. The key thing I like to point out that's different in monetary policy in my lifetime, and I'm almost 60, is we have never had an example of pumping this much liquidity in, in the system. and massive inflation short term um and the repercussions of that so if human nature has not changed we've learned the lessons of too much liquidity and too much inflation inflation hurt everybody we all know that's still hurting everybody um and to get that down so it's going to tick downward but for chairman powell to push back and everything he said is that to push back and what arthur burns and president nixon did for the 1970 election which was pump the system up too much and then we ended up with all that inflation afterwards is quite odd so i think what's going to happen is what went up on the elevator in terms of interest rates will go down on the escalator go down much slowly and now we're in that cat and mouse game between the fed cuts and the stock market rallying so here's one thing i i published a piece a year ago and i just republished it and just changed a few words it was that key kind of headline the cat and mouse game and that is we started pricing in the fed fund futures we started pricing for 100 basis points of cuts in q1 2023 and they still hiked 100 basis points last year so 
obviously very restrictive. So now the market's priced for so much ease and so much perfect, perfect perfection, so much liquidity. Gold's picking that up. That's why gold's outperforming the stock market. The risks are we get a little bit normal reversion. So I'll end with this. I like to look at, sometimes you just look at S&P 500 versus 100-week moving average. It's very simple. You go back to 1999, it never pops more than 25%. The spike during the, the uh, biggest money pump in history a few years ago was 29%. And then it went right, right down that 100-week moving average. Now we're about 25% above that level. It's just not a level you want to go out and be out overweight long equities. Now, I think the bots are, the AI-driven systems are, but the rational hedge fund money managers who run leveraged money are looking at this and saying, yeah, they've been buying bonds. There's been a decent amount of, you can just see these downtick every day in that bond yield. It looks like there's an allocation towards bonds because I think they see those deflationary forces starting and the Fed starting. Yeah, to- I'll pull this report up from a year ago. The cat and mouse game that could crush the global economy. <laughs> I remember I interviewed you about this before. This is a great report. Yeah. Uh, paragraph or section two, plunging commodities may be a precursor for severe deflationary forces on the back of a vigilant Fed focusing on sticky and laggy inflation forces. This is, uh, uh, y- you asked the question, are commodities indicating a deflation train wreck? This was a year ago. Now, we haven't had, I'll let you comment if we've had outright deflation in some sectors yet, but the direction that you called was correct, which is that we're going to get lower inflation, disinflation. The inflation rate has been coming down 2.9% was the lowest reading. Are we seeing deflation yet? So first, uh, thanks for responding that um Remind me, I rem- I'm bringing that one out. So first of all, I was early, and some people would say wrong, but that's where things are going now. So remember, deflation is always a measure of when you things come too high, inflation lifts assets up too high, and they go down. So one good example is the Bloomberg Commodity Index is down. 30% from its peak in 2022. That's deflation. You just raise, raise the base too high. The average price of home in this country is between four hundred dollars and $500,000 a year. That's almost doubled in 10 years. So when that goes down, which it typically does, that's deflation. And that's the problem. But the thing is, every lesson of history, I, I can mention a dozen books. The one, I'll just mention one, the price of of time by Edward Chancellor just points out when you get these massive liquidity pumps, deflation always follows. Now, it's also focusing on what's coming on in China. I have to narrow in in China. Yields are plunging there for a reason. Even despite the best efforts of the government to make bond yields go higher, there's such a flight to quality um, away from any, and, and such a demand pull out of that country in the back of an unlimited friendship and starting a war and your best customers back yard, which is silly, um, that you have to expect those forces to continue and potentially accelerate. And that's what's happening in commodities. So you look at industrial metals index I, in industrial metals, it were in the Bloomberg industrial metals index is what was up about 24% in the year. Now it's about unchanged. Bloomberg commodity index was about up about 12% on the year. Now it's roughly unchanged and gold just keeps taking off. So you take gold versus everything else. It's the only real commodity that's taken off. But if you look at gold relative to most commodities, that trajectory Three, gold up, commodities down, is very similar to what we saw during the great financial crisis and certainly the velocity of it. So unless gold's wrong and it plunges soon, um, to me, that's where I point to the, the tinderbox awaiting a bit of a catalyst is just a little bit of normal reversion of the U.S. stock market. And you're showing that, showing that volatility is starting to pick up. So basically, it has to stay strong. If it just backs up for a normal correction, say it gets maybe just to its 200-day or its 100-week moving average, it's our, it's still pointing upward, that will tilt over to severe deflationary forces. And to me, is this, that's where we are right now is there's too much expectations for that stock market to stay up just to keep things stable versus everything else I see is showing deflationary forces. Okay, just on the gold price uh, repeating the last financial crisis. This is the gold price versus the S and P 500. Okay, the S the S P X is the purple line, and I'm showing this because I'm just highlighting the fact that this year, over the last 12 months, there's been a very close correlation as well. They've both moved up in tandem. So um, I don't know what this means in the broader context right. of things. Now I'll let you comment on this, but it certainly seems like everything is moving up. It's not just gold moving up predicating a sort of global recession or or economic catastrophe. It's everything going up at the same time, right? It is until it isn't. So I love that chart. So if you take that same chart, what I, I yeah. have done a lot of, I've published the same 200-day moving average on gold, S&P 500, and Bitcoin. They're all heading straight up in the same trajectory, except for the last three weeks now, Bitcoin's below its 200-day moving average. It's telling yeah. you this is where it's going. And if you take the same 200-day moving average of, of the VIX volatility index, it's straight down. 
the crocodile jaws are about to narrow. The question is who wins? So I look at it is typically the highest, what's the highest volatility of all those? Bitcoin. And what's up the most in history? Bitcoin. So what's leading the way down? It makes sense. It's leading the way down. It needs to show the opposite. And I think when volatility yeah. picks up, this, and we all know when volatility picks up in the stock market, stock market going down initially will pull gold down, but it's almost really good for that S&P 500 to gold ratio. So right now, it's basically about 2.2 ounces of gold per one S&P 500. Historically, that's very expensive for the stock market and very cheap for gold. And anytime that has happened in history, and we've gone towards an inverted curve and recession, Gold and the S&P 500 just kind of gravitate towards one to one. That's not very profound to say. It's a fact to point that out, and I think that's where we're going. This is a this has been a very good um, explanation for the economic backdrop. So let's get your forecast now. Starting with inflation, uh, we talked about uh, inflation just now. So you wrote a re- recent report uh, entitled PPI, CPI, retail sales, and deflating commodities. Uh, PPI is something that we don't talk about a lot in the media. We focus on the CPI a lot, and of course, the Fed looks at the PCE. But the PPI, the producer price index, is just as important. You wrote here in our database since 1993, never has the average of producer price indexes from the U.S., China, Japan, and Germany been lower and Fed funds higher with implications for more commodity deflation. Okay, tell us why we should be concerned or paying attention to at least – to the PPI. So first I'll mention PPI is basically a high beta, high volatility version of CPI. It typically leads. It's much more commodity focused. Uh, uh, guilty. I'm a commodity guy. And right now it's around 2%. The big spike we had to last year was around to what, 19? I see the high was 18%. It reverted down to negative. And Fed funds are very much above that rate. That's clearly restrictive. Chairman Powell said it's clearly restrictive. But if you add in PPI from China, it's still negative. It's really bad. So um, and that's how much you can trust the data. So I'm not as trustworthy as the data. But the point is, Fed funds extremely high, PPI extremely low is a contractuary. It's it's just a sign of very restrictive Fed rate policy. And the thing is, they'll start cutting rates, but it's going to be in a delayed reaction. And the point is, we're all tilting towards that re- that deflationary recession. Most notably, China. A lot of Europe's already already going there. And it's why everything is tilted on the U.S. stock market staying lofty, which is why I think once you just get a 10 percent correction, which in stock markets is usually normal, we just had a little bit, everything tilts downward. It, it takes out that wealth effect. Um, and these are the all the indications point that way. But I like to compare those two because also if you look at the average. So there's PPIs, average of um, 10 year bond yields in the top five countries in the world, just next to the U.S., which is. China, Japan, UK, Germany, and India, the average of those bond yields are about 100 basis points below the US 10 year. Now, that was about a month ago. That's a little bit less now. Right before the financial crisis, those the average of those were much higher than the U.S. I mean, uh, it just points out to me relatively how low U.S. bond yields are. So when people say, oh, the deficit's a problem, I'm like, yeah, on a standalone basis, but compared to history and compared to the rest of the world, U.S. bond yields are still quite high at these levels, and rates are still extremely high, particularly if we just get a little bit of back and fill in the stock market, because that would be the severe deflationary force, which is very normal following the kind of inflation we had on the back of the biggest money pump in history. And, and that's just based on studying the what usually happens in cycles. And I'm just looking for things to stop that from happening. So I'll mention one, you, you mentioned earlier, what's the clear, clear thing that's deflated? Let's look at the number one measure of heat, electricity, and fertilizer in this country. Natural gas right now is about two bucks per MMBTU. The high was 10 and it's hovering around the low this year was around 1.5, 1.6. That tr- level was first traded in 1990 in futures when futures first opened. So that is a sign of severe deflationary forces. That's normal in commodities, partly because we create more with less every day. And despite the fact we have debasing fiat currencies, these underlying commodities still tick down in price. Look at natural gas right now. I'm sorry, crude oil, WTI crude oil, the most world's most significant commodity, which is being um, recycled away with uh, technology at $74 a barrel right now. It was first traded in 2006. That's about 20 years ago. Um, that's what happens to commodities. Copper is the only one that really made a new high this year. It went up to five dollars and twenty cents, and it's already yeah. back down to near four. Why? Yeah. Because it, it went up for the wrong reasons on the back of speculative excesses. So, from commodities, I can show you those are clear deflationary forces. And then it's just a question of what else will 
either compliment that or reject that. And I'm worried that's just a little bit of compliment comes from that reversion equities that you're seeing already in the bottom in VIX. And the Fed's going to be reluctant to tease at all until I think the stock market tells them to by going down. Does a PPI usually lead the PP, uh, CPI? Yeah, it's a higher beta. So it's typically, a, let's say in the last 20 years, it has a two beta, two, di- two times beta to to. PPI to CPI and CPI it can be very convoluted and con- include very confusing things like owner's equivalent rent. I mean, if you own a home and it, and it goes from four hundred to five hundred thousand, it says it's a CPI, which is a drag. No, it's not for you. It's a good positive for your net ability to spend and wealth effect. But that's where it's somewhat dicey. That's where also as a commodity guy, PPI number one, it's a higher beta. It's more. Um, it, it's has most uh, basically double the volatility of CPI and it's oftentimes the leader. Here's an article from Bloomberg uh, dated about uh, a week ago. The headline reads, Wall Street sees end of Fed's balance sheet runoff this year. So people are projecting the end of or the Fed to taper, their taper program, so to speak, the end of QT. What's this going to do for inflation if indeed the forecast is correct? Well, I think that's all part of, um, on a scale of 1 to 10 compared to Fed rate, which is right now 5.33% as we speak, that's just part of the whole um, restricting money supply to reduce inflation outlook. Now, just rolling and the Fed's going to start easing and taking, stopping the quantitative tightening makes sense. But what was that? A lot of that was just the the quantitative easing that was just being um, disconnected. So I'm less concerned about that. The thing is that we always have to think about is if and or when there's ever a big problem with credit in this country, a big spike in bond yields, the Fed's almost always there to save you. And that's part of the reason I'm still quite bullish for treasury long bonds and gold. But I think that's just part of the whole punch bowl be taken, um, has been significantly taken away. Now they're potentially going to put it back. But why? Because they see that whole, the tilt towards deflationary recessionary forces and the bottom line for the fed is this rising unemployment number according to anna wong by the time they get to that next meeting um unemployment might be 4.5 percent which is well more than one percent above the 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 low and still ticking higher that could be a key reason for them to, to cut more than 25 although i sure don't think they will so let's talk about the forecast for your um for for commodities and uh risk assets so you mentioned you're still long or bullish gold gold just recently broke a new all-time high last weekend surpassing twenty five hundred dollars an ounce it's not over yet this momentum well um no i think now and what gold is it's to me a matter of time it's going to get to three thousand to not say that too much at ad nauseum i think it's now lifted that floor which was two thousand and then twenty two hundred it's probably around 2400 remember it first pr- printed 2400 in april it hovered there forever now that's kind of the, the it's that stair step base moving higher but it's the fundamental facts of gold that are just overwhelming and this is something that's never happened in my lifetime and that is this i can't write to write the hist- history books about it. it started with president z's unlimited friendship with president putin and then the um decisive enabling according to nato of the war in ukraine now that was nato's comment um that shifted the world order it shifted it towards gold when you have wars in in countries um debasing currencies you're always going to go for gold it's not an inflationary thing right now it's the opposite because it's we're pricing gold in u.s dollars it's that tilt towards u.s deflation now the recession so to me that shifted the world order the thing is i'll point about gold in the near term is that almost if you look at the gold the s p 500 ratio when the yield curves when unemployment bottoms from such a low level and the yield curve disinverts from such a significant inversion it almost always supports gold versus s p 500 so it's looking forward to that the fed easing the significance is traders are on top of it. Hedge funds are managed money net positions of total open interest and gold futures are about 44%. The whole time high is around 48%. So they're really near the upper end of the range. Um, but the unique thing is um, obviously all the buying of gold from central banks led by China. That's the most significant fa- fa- factor. Deepest pockets on the planet are still buying. They might lighten up. But the thing I really like to fo- focus on is ETF holdings in the U.S. have dropped from about 110 total million ounces to about 80. Now they're around 82 and just starting to turn upward. So to me, the next b- biggest impetus for gold to take off will be when you have a little bit of reversion in that mantra. I like to point is why buy gold when the U.S. stock market's on a tear and you get 5% T-bills. 
once we see a little reversion in that, which we will, to me, that's what really accelerates gold. My, gold, but it might happen with a little backup first, because that's certainly what happened. Two thousand eight, gold went from up to up to a thousand. Two thousand eight dropped down to seven hundred, and then up to nineteen hundred in two thousand eleven. I think things are similar. Just right now, it's getting a little stretched. But what's more, the, here's one thing I'll end with. I published recently, just pointed out 100-week mover and averages of gold versus S&P 500. They're both about 25% above those levels. But that's really, really rare for the S&P 500. For gold, it's normal. It can get up to 30, 35% above its 100-week mover and average on a decent bull market. So that's the difference when we have a bit of a flight to quality, a reversion, I would say, of very expensive risk assets like the stock market. And the problem is they're still going up. So Gold is just kind of hanging out, and I think it's just getting started, but it's going to have some volatility. Uh, U.S. 10-year, uh, it's currently at 3.85. Uh, significant decline from where it was previously in the year. Uh, even from last year, it was at 5%. So you said you were long bonds or you're bullish long bonds. Uh, where do you see the 10-year heading from here? Yeah, that's the thing. is I, I don't um, have hardly any positions. Everything has to be pre-cleared. I don't trade. Sure. Everything I do is I don't give investment advice. This is where I think markets are going. So one thing I really like about that 10, you know, what it was bumping up against 4% as resistance. And now that's support for yield. So I mean, now it's, I'm sorry, it's bumping up against their support. Now it's 40% resistance. I think it's dropping lower. And I just look at over that China 10, you know, at 2.17%. I mean, the all-time low is 209 there's a lot of room for that 10 year note yield to follow the Chinese 10 year note, which I think it will, um, and go back to that elongated bull market bond since the early 80s, which a lot of people gave up on in a normal recession. And the key thing is the deflationary forces I see now are worse than what I saw in 2006, 7, and 8. Like I pointed out, diesel demand is declining. The excess of supply and demand out of the U.S. and Canada in petroleum is the most ever. It's 6 million barrels a day. That's um, container board demand is declining. Unleaded gas demand is declining. Yes, we had a little spike up for Labor Day and in, in the summer driving season, but it's all tilting back downward. Um, and that to me is where I think also what's been the most beat up trades for almost three, four years now, and that's U.S. Treasury long bonds. And my lesson with trading, that was where I started in the business in 1988 and started in that bond futures pit in Chicago. And I had, used to have hair too. To me, just that's the lesson of being a long bond guy is that's the best time. I think they, they usually perform the best after they then beat up the most. And this to me is what's happening now. It just to, the, similar to the bullish factor in gold, just a little bit of startup um, reversion in the stock market will, will accelerate these organic deflationary forces, which are very much normal on the back of the inflation we got to 2022 peak due to just the excess of liquidity. Finally, I'd like to end on your risk assets outlook. So uh, this is a chart showing the Fed funds rate. I'm showing you this chart because in the past, every single time we've had a peak in the Fed funds rate yeah. and a pivot that followed uh, an Enver designated recession as denoted by these gray bars followed that pivot. Okay, let's assume, again, I'm making a lot of assumptions here. Let's assume history repeats itself and we get another Enver designated recession following this Fed pivot. Well, recessions typically have not been very bullish events for risk assets. So can we assume that you know, can we conclude that this Fed pivot may actually be a bearish event for stocks? Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. It is once they start easing, it's going to be down on the um, on the escalator. It's going to go down slowly. They have to because they have to can't make this mistakes of um, Arthur Burns and President Nixon <laughs> and then Volcker fixed. Um, and that is um, pumping too much liquidity and, and, and easing too early. And they, they're they going to keep a very close eye on the equity market because stretched equities are part of what's driving inflation. It's silly not to think it's not when you're two times GDP. Um, and the equity market's most expensive ever versus the housing market. So it's just we're so elevated in terms of risk assets. Part of the reason Fed funds are so elevated, once they start going down, I think it's going to be that cat and mouse game of risk assets going down, the Fed falling. And it's a question of how far it goes and how long it lasts. So I, I think the stock market's great on a tear. It's potentially going to make an all-time new high, maybe a double top. Who knows? But the tilt towards what you pointed out and what we've been pointing out, once they start easing, um, it's very rare to have – and the curve starts disinverting, um, and you're – 
global. This is a global move. Now, remember, China is clearly in, in, the, in issues. Europe is clearly having issues um, that this, to me, is potentially the reset of a lifetime. Now, I started writing about that almost two years ago. It was delayed. It was been wrong. But that's the key thing about delayed reactions. I'm very, I think it's very disconcerting once we start heading back that way. Um, and uh, like I said, it's very clearly happening in commodities. What reset of the lifetime, let's end it here. What does that look like after this reset is over? One bridge at a time. Don't know. Starts with the first fed, first fed ease. And the bottom line is that you look at the U.S. stock market. It's the most expensive on a market cap to GDP paces versus the late 1920s and early 30s. So just a little reversion means that's all going to that's all that's going to matter. Um, and so I want to start there. If stocks stay resilient that's wonderful we're all doing fine but this i think is a tremendous tactical opportunity i think it's a great opportunity for your average investor to kind of underweight risk assets just focus on more risk off it's like fixed income bonds good old u.s treasuries um but the thing is this is way human nature always works it usually get to a cycle it's almost unheard of to do that until markets make them do that so yeah, well, what's the catalyst we need to see this equity market downturn? Because I'm, right now I'm looking at the NASDAQ, for example. It's, a, it's already gained back most, not all, but most of its summer losses since the uh, since its peak in July. And uh, to your point about um, sentiment, I, 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 I presume you know sentiment may still be strong enough to push it to a new all-time high, like you said. Do we need to see weaker earnings? Do we need to see um, – Further deceleration in the economy? Do we need to see the Fed really pivot, which may signal weakness? I mean, something needs to give before people start piling in the shorts. Yeah, exactly. So that's we're not even talking about piling in the shorts yet. No, actually, we've seen a lot of that, and they keep getting stopped out. But a unique yeah. comment I heard from our, our chief equity strategist, Gina Martin-Adams, that she's afraid if the Fed starts cutting rates too quickly, Interesting. That's well, that's going to be bad for equities because it's going to help the start um, accelerate the unwind of the yen carry trade. Now, that's the problem is I remember focusing on that over two decades ago when I was trading JGBs. I mean, it's just that entrenched. So uh, catalyst, I don't know. Um, bottom line is right now, unemployment's rising. So we're heading that way. And we see major signs of strapped con consumers everywhere. So it's typically the bottom line is what was the signal in 1929? It's just assets, the stock market got too expensive and then reverted. And right now, it's still getting more expensive, which is a wonderful thing. So it, it's hard to pinpoint, pinpoint what's going to flip the switch. But I'll end with this. What um, A thing I quote I heard from um, Roger Babson in, in, uh, in September of 1929, he was speaking to a group of investors, is, I will tell you, I told you um, about the stock market last year and the year before at this time, that it's going to go down. Now, he was wrong for a while. I said that about gold recently, when I was beginning this year. I said, I'll just say what I've been saying for the last three years. It's going to go up. Um, yes, I was early. It took a while. But that's the key thing. The bottom line is we need to have, we have to hope the stock market goes doesn't go down and everything will be fine. But if we have normal reversion that kicks in, the deflational dominoes, dominoes, dominoes tumble and they've already started that way. I think the yield curve's on top of it. I think gold's on top of it. Commodities are on top of it. Um, and typically stock markets are last. Excellent. Thank you very much for your update today. Where can we learn more from you? Well, on your show. Thank you. I really appreciate people tuning in. I appreciate being on your show. Um, on, and definitely on Bloomberg Terminal, on X at Mike McGlone 11, and on LinkedIn, Mike McGlone, Senior Commodity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Great. We'll put those links down below, so make sure to check out uh, Mike's work there. Thank you very much. We'll speak again soon. Thank you, David. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and protect your online privacy. Click on the link down below in the description. Join deleteme.com slash David Lynn or scan the QR code here for 20% off.